Over 200 members of young farmers clubs attend a camp and demonstrations at Norton in southern Rhodesia. Every branch of farming was dealt with and the young farmers watched demonstrations of the latest methods of weed control. This is a large scale method and so too is the use of aircraft in spraying insecticides. This was one of the most impressive items on the program and called for precision flying. The turbulence setup assists complete coverage, but alas, on this occasion, it appeared that something more was required to prevent Rhodesian agriculture from going to the dogs. Norton School was the headquarters, and the young farmers soon showed their inborn love of animals. Having heard the expression, killing with kindness, we were a little apprehensive of the Jersey calf's efforts to please everybody. On the other hand, one of the goats cheerfully wolfed all that was offered. Irrigation was an important subject, and probably more than any other, it arouses a responsive note in the young farmer's mind. The government's tremendous interest in this movement was shown by the presence of Southern Rhodesia's Prime Minister, Mr. Garfield Todd, who opened the conference. There is good reason for praise and applause, for the young farmers' clubs of Southern Rhodesia are making great strides towards the attainment of their main objectives. In terms of their slogan, this means better farmers, better countrymen, better citizens. Thirty-five miles west of Livingston, Katambora Reformatory School deals with African child delinquents from all parts of northern Rhodesia. Here, misguided youths enter a world of understanding. And it is here that the learning of a skill sets them on the road to becoming useful, self-respecting citizens. Their sentence to a four-year course of training can hardly be regarded as a punitive sentence, for the lads are as happy as schoolboys should be. In this school without bars, most of them seem content to remain for the full four-year term. Eager to learn in many activities, they help the reformatory, particularly in building in which they reach a high standard, and in tailoring in which they make, among other things, the warders uniform. Not all the skills taught are purely manual, for some learn typing and will later find useful clerical situations. In all cases, vocational training is combined with academic training. Katambora is salvaging many young lives from the human scrap heap and is restoring them to physical, mental and social fitness. To look like this when complete, the Arundel Girls School, five miles outside Salisbury, is already under construction. It is, as Lord Morgan pointed out when laying the foundation stone, a private school, and as such will receive no financial assistance from the government. It will, however, serve the whole of the Federation, helping to make up the backlog that the senior girls' schools require. Estimated to cost a quarter of a million, the funds to build and maintain Arundel School are being privately raised. A mighty project, it is an investment in the future. The Archbishop of Canterbury visits Cyrene Mission outside Bulawayo. Cyrene has now become world famous for the art of its students, and will soon have a new chapel of which the Archbishop laid the foundation stone. Among Cyrene's artists is the crippled sculptor Sam Songo, at present sculpturing two biblical figures in stone. For him, there was a special word of encouragement. At World's View, the Archbishop of Canterbury, like so many visitors before him, was impressed by the simplicity of the inscription in its setting of rugged grandeur. He visited the graves of both Rhodes and Jamison. At the Guero Town Hall, the Mayor and Mayoress waited to greet him on his arrival. At a tea party in the Town Hall, Dr. Fisher gave an interesting speech, which was highly appreciated. Some 20 miles away, he visited the Shabani Asbestos Mine, where 4,000 African natives live and work. His coming was eagerly awaited, and the Africans were highly honored by the visit of the spiritual leader of their faith. Here too, my Lord Archbishop saw something of the workings of this important mining enterprise. A 
feature of his visit to Antali in the Eastern Districts was an open-air service, one of many impressive open-air services he conducted in the Federation. The congregation was of mixed racial origins, but were united by the profession of the same faith. Returning to Salisbury, Dr. Fisher attended a tobacco auction. Bale after bale was sold rapidly under the auctioneer's non-stop barrage, and the Archbishop obviously appreciated his ready wit. He also saw something of the processing of tobacco. Today, one of the Federal's most valuable exports. This was one of the sidelights of his visit to Salisbury. For the highlight, the setting was St. Mary's Cathedral. For within these sacred walls took place the inauguration of the Church of the Province of Central Africa, a unifying of the Anglican Church throughout the Federation under a newly appointed Archbishop. Participating were four Anglican bishops and presiding were the Archbishop of Cape Town and the Archbishop of Canterbury. Never in Southern Africa has the Church of England held a more impressive service. St. Mary's Cathedral glittered with the reflection of richly embroidered vestments, and the scene was one of great solemnity and beauty, rich in colour, rich in colourful tradition. service reaches its climax when the Archbishop of Cape Town and the Archbishop of Canterbury sign the release, releasing the dioceses from their jurisdiction. With this act, the Church of the Province of Central Africa becomes self-governing. In hushed silence, the Archbishop of Cape Town appends his signature, and then the release is signed by the Archbishop of Canterbury. The Church in Central Africa is an autonomous body by virtue of its new constitution given and delivered this day. Later, the Archbishop of Canterbury laid the foundation stone of the new bell tower to be added to St. Mary's Cathedral, a fine new addition to the cathedral which has gained stature from today's inauguration. At 8 o'clock that night, the new Archbishop of Central Africa, Dr. E. F. Paget, was presented to the people. Taking his hands, the Archbishops of Cape Town and Canterbury presented him. Following the presentation, the Archbishop of Canterbury led the Archbishop of Central Africa to his throne. There, he presented him with the primatial cross. The installation of the new Archbishop is accomplished. And with traditional ritual, he is dedicated anew to the service of God and to the furtherance of his gospel throughout the peoples and the broad acres of Central Africa.